This is my recap and review of the final episode of Wheel of Time season two. Now in today's video, I'm gonna recap the episode, then I will review what I loved about episode eight, what I did not love, and I'll give my overall thoughts and a score for the episode. So join me as I recap and review episode eight of Wheel of Time season two, titled What Was Meant to Be. Before we dive into the recap, take a moment and like the video and subscribe to the channel if you love Wheel of Time related content. Obviously, I cover the show here, but if you want to see things on the books, lore videos, top 10 lists on the most powerful channelers, then subscribe to the channel and check out my back catalog of all kinds of Wheel of Time videos. I've got hundreds of videos on the channel all about the Wheel of Time series. Let's kick things off with a recap of the episode, starting with the cold open. In the cold open, we flash back 3,000 years and we see Luz there and Telamon sealing away a Shamael with some other male channelers. The dialogue here sets up that Luz Theron locked away a Shamael to keep him from being reborn again and saying that he didn't want to keep doing this over and over again, which is a line that will come back later in the episode. In the current time, the White Cloaks are camped outside of Falm, obstructed by the mountains, preparing to attack the Shanchan. Dane Bornhold has joined his father, Jeff from Bornhold, and they are prepared to march into numbers that they're overwhelmed by to fight the Shanchan. They then, after creating a lot of smoke to obscure their approach, attack the city, ride inside, intent on taking a large tower in the city where they know the Shanchan will put the Damani when they're attacked. Moraine, Lan, Rand, and Lanfear start in the ways where they were at the end of the last episode, but Lanfear pushes Lan and Moraine out onto a beach near Falm, and then presumably uses the One Power to travel directly to Falm with Rand. Lanfear then shows up to talk with Ashamael, who is genuinely upset at her that she has brought Rand earlier than he wanted, not believing that things are ready to turn him to the dark. He correctly deduces that she has turned on him and arranges to have Matt stab Rand, as men had seen, using the Shadar Logoth dagger that is in Padon Fane's possession. He sends Padon Fane to tempt Matt with the dagger, and Padon Fane places it in front of him, knowing that he's going to pick it up. However, rather than picking up the dagger, Matt decides to attach it to the end of a quarterstaff, creating a spear, but then without touching the dagger itself. He then escapes the room kills a guard, and then runs away with other guards chasing him. As the White Cloak attack on the city begins, Perrin and the Aiel, who had also just arrived in the city themselves, run into Loyal and Ingtar and Masima, who have the Horn of Valir in tow. Ingtar wants to escape the city, but Loyal reminds them that they are the heroes of today, and they go to find Egwene and save her rather than leave her in the city. In the process, they are surrounded by Shan Chan, and Ingtar sacrifices himself to prevent the Shan Chan from getting the Horn. Rand is looking for Egwene, but comes comes across High Lord Turok and his entourage in the process. Turok sees Rand's Heronmark blade and appears ready to fight Rand, wondering what a Heronmark takes to get on this side of the ocean. And rather than engaging in a fight, Rand decides to kill all of them by channeling the One Power and just moves on. While the attack is progressing, the Suldam prepare the Damani to defend the town and take them to the tower where the White Cloaks are trying to reach. Rena takes Egwene there, but not before warning her that if she does not behave, Rena will cut her tongue out. Rena then cuts off Egwene braid to further hurt her before they head to the tower. On top of the tower, Egwene is forced to send fireballs into the invading White Cloaks, which she complies with at first, but later she starts being forced to hurt civilians, and she refuses, and the Suldam begins to punish her, about to cut out her tongue when that tower is attacked by White Cloak trebuchets, and the top of the tower is hit, killing most of the Damani and splitting Egwene and Arena up. During that time, Elaine, Nynaeve, and the Suldam, they captured in the last episode, make their way towards the tower to rescue Egwene, but the Suldam is shot by a White Cloak arrow in the neck, she dies, and then Elaine is also wounded by another arrow. Unable to channel, Nynaeve pushes the arrow through Lade's leg, and they limp towards the tower, intent on finding Egwene. Matt eventually runs into Perrin, Loyal, and the Aiel as he runs away from the Shanchan. They kill the Shanchan, and Matt helps the group open the Horn of Valir's case, takes the horn himself as more Shanchan attack. Perrin tells him that they need to get the horn to Rand. As they hold off off the Shan Chan, Matt runs off with the horn. Perrin and the crew end up fighting side by side with White Cloaks against the Shan Chan until Valda sees Perrin, goes in a rage, calling him a dark friend, knocks him down, and tries to kill him. Hopper, who Perrin had told to stay outside the city, is such a good boy and comes out of nowhere and attacks Valda to save Perrin. 
While Hopper's being the best boy, ripping Valda's arm apart, Jeff from Bornhold comes over to save Valda and smacks Hopper in the back with his axe, killing him. Of course, this drives Perrin into a rage, and he goes and actually kills Jeff from Bornhold with an axe that he finds. Of course, Dane Bornhold witnesses this, gets pissed, wants to go after Perrin, but gets yanked away. Egwene and Renna are the only two left alive on top of the tower, and they face off against each other. As Renna comes to punish Egwene, Egwene gra had grabbed the collar of one of the dead Damani that had fallen off of her after she died. She pushes it on Renna, and now they both have each other leashed. This allows Egwene to force Renna to remove her collar, as Egwene has Renna hanging and choking in a very similar way to what Renna did to Egwene earlier in the previous episodes. Despite Egwene being able to feel her pain, she pushes through it, determined to break Renna. Once Renna removes the Idom from Egwene, Egwene instead does not release Renna from hers and allows her to die from hanging on the column. Right after Egwene is freed and she allows Renna to die, Rand arrives and lets her know that he's alive and that he had come to save her, but notice that she didn't need saving. Just then, Ashamael shows up, disables Egwene, knocks Rand over before having him shielded by some Damani that he had hiding on one of the ships in the harbor. As Matt runs with the horn towards those towers, though, he's stopped by a large number of Shanchan soldiers who begin coming towards him. In the moment, scared to death, he blows the horn of Valir, and the heroes of the horn show up and tell him that not only do they know him, but that he is one of them. Matt realizes that he is actually a good person. He's a hero of the horn, and he leads the other heroes against the Shan Chan with Uno coming back as a hero of the horn. Matt then runs to the top of the tower and sees a Shamael in front of Rand and throws the spear that he had been using at him, but it's an illusion of a Shamael, and the spear hits Rand in the side, causing a very bad wound and fulfilling the vision that Min had of Matt stabbing Rand. As a Shamael then moves in to kill Rand and Matt, as Rand is dying on the ground, Egwene steps in to defend him with the one power, creating a shield. Now she struggles to hold off Ashamael as he viciously attacks at her shield. She is able to hold him off until Perrin shows up with Uno's shield that he was given as a hero of the horn that probably has some type of magical properties. And then also Elaine and Nynaeve show up and Elaine heals Rand's wound, at least partially. Rand asks who she is as he's being healed and they share a brief moment where of course they fell deeply in love. Maureen and Lan, who had been thrown out on the the beach notice the shield from the ships in the harbor going up to the tower shielding Rand and Moraine destroys the Shan Chan ships where the Damani are shielding Rand. She uses fire to do this. Lan fights off the attackers of the Shan Chan who are trying to stop her. He kills a whole bunch of them while she destroys their entire fleet. As the shield drops on Rand, he channels, heats up his Heron Mark sword and stabs it through Ashamael's heart, killing him and causing him to fade to dust. In the process, it brands a Heron on Rand's hand. Moraine Moraine seeing what had happened and knowing the prophecies about the dragon being proclaimed in fire above Falm, she uses the fire she was destroying the ships with to create a dragon that flies around the tower and creates a spectacle that everybody in Falm can see. Rand and the entire group stand at the top of the tower as all of the onlookers stare at Rand, who is now clearly the Dragon Reborn. The episode ends with Lanfear happily going to Ashamael's rooms, knowing that he's dead, to get the seals that he had been storing so that she could discard of them. But she finds that they are not only broken and, and they've all been freed, but she also finds that Mogidian is sitting there waiting for her and had prepared a trap for Lanfear. As Lanfear is trapped, she warns Lanfear that she will come after her if she stays around Rand, tells him to stay, tells her to stay away, and then she travels, leaving Lanfear on her own, who who then ends the episode by saying, Light help you, Rand Al Thor, as all the other Forsaken are now free. So that was the episode, but let's now talk about what I loved from the episode. And I think I'll start by saying this this is such an improvement on the finale of season one, now as low of a bar as that may be. This was light years ahead of that in scale, in execution and just overall epicness. I think the battle felt large. I think it felt appropriately scaled. They actually pulled it off on a far bigger scale than I thought they would, given that this is just a TV show. I know it's easy to feel like this is small. We're used to large-scale CGI battles from movies, specifically like Marvel movies. Think like Avengers Endgame. Even though this show has a large budget, it's $100 million over eight episodes, basically nine hours of TV, whereas a movie could have $200 million budget for a CGI spectacle, and that's just for two hours. It's not the same. It's not in the same league. So what they pulled off, I think, was large. I think it was 
epic, especially for a TV show. This was far bigger and better, in my opinion, than the Battle of the Blackwater did in season two of Game of Thrones. I think Matt blowing the horn was really cool to see. I think they gave him a fine ending. I, I still don't love his arc for the whole season, but we'll get to that in my final review. I'm hoping that this is the end of boring and sulky Matt. I think that the Egwene and Renna scenes were spectacular again. That dynamic is great, and Madeline Madden has just been incredible. She's been great this season in general, but these last couple episodes, she's been out of her mind. I love the future setup that we saw in the episode as well, from Masima staring up in awe at the dragon in the sky, to the heron on Rand's palm, to the Forsaken showing up, and knowing that they're all free now. They have set up future seasons quite well and brought all of the characters back together after being forced to have them apart from COVID and Barney Harris leaving. All of that in season one, it forced changes in season two that left them having to rewrite some of the scripts, and that actually did affect season two. For instance, Matt was in White Tower and he was going to be with them. That was a change they were forced to make because of Barney leaving. I think this episode was meant to be a payoff episode and an episode that properly set up a future season, and for the most part, I think they accomplished that pretty well. But let's talk about some of the things I did not love. By and large, this episode suffered from something that I think happens in lots of movies and lots of TV shows in that it required a pretty large suspension of disbelief to make it feel plausible. To be clear, that's not always a bad thing. I could go through and nitpick the hell out of Marvel movies for plot holes, stupid choices that don't seem like choices characters would make that are just there to further the plot. But at the end of the day, I'm still entertained by Marvel movies. Avengers Endgame had a lot of stupid plot points, but the movie's largely a ton of fun to watch. The Dark Knight has a ton of this as the Joker seems to be able to do everything. He sets bombs up in a hospital. He stages his own arrest. All of those have so many factors that he couldn't control to make them happen. It's very implausible. It's still really entertaining. So, right, while I could nitpick it, I still liked it, and it's one of the best movies ever, in my opinion. I'm certainly not, to be clear, comparing this episode to those movies, but I simply want to say that there were a lot of stupid elements in this episode, like the white cloak kids shaking their little things uh, that were basically candles to create smoke across an entire plane. Rand somehow bypassing the same force of Sean Chan that Matt had to fight through to get to the tower. The tower in the city moving closer to the edge of the city so that the White Cloaks could hit it with a trebuchet. I could go on and on. None of those things really truly matter because they were still fun to watch. Again, if you want to come into this to nitpick, you can let that distract you and yeah, it's going to have problems then. And I definitely think there was a lot of that to be very, very clear. There was a huge need to suspend your disbelief to really enjoy this, which for the most part I was able to do. What's weird about this though is the first time I watched the episode with my screener, I didn't like it nearly as much as I did on the second watch. And I, I think a lot of that was there were lots of changes from the books. And I know they've been doing that a lot. Why should we care about changes from the books at this point? They've been doing it up to here a lot. I just think it's odd how odd some of those changes were. To give some examples, having Elaine heal Rand, that's not something that she could even do in the books. Nynaeve was right there. And even though she should have been furious with Egwene being a slave, basically, she was wasn't able to channel. And so Elaine did it instead. Not a huge deal to somebody who hasn't read the books, but definitely not something that would have made sense in the books. Moraine suddenly being able to channel from miles away and destroy ships and break the three oaths, presumably. Even though I'm not sure that that's what they were implying she was supposed to do, she did. Ingtar's dark friend reveal not making it into the show. I think that was clearly cut for time because they actually set it up and then they just didn't do it. All of those things, big changes from the books, and there were plenty more too. As I watched it a second time, I let my book reader self go for a moment, and I realized to non-readers, those things aren't going to be weird. They wouldn't even be issues for them. They were probably still pretty entertaining. Yeah, I, I think it's, if I can separate that, it was a better episode to me. I think though there were a few things I did have major problems with. One of which was the tragic and complete underuse of Pot on Fate. I said this in my last review, and it's a shame they have wasted such a good character. He's apparently not doing his rebel dark friend plot line, he doesn't even seem to have the dagger anymore. I almost wish that he just hadn't been in the story because what we're getting now just isn't that interesting to me. And it's a shame because Johan Myers is amazing in the role. Another thing I for sure did not like was Uno coming back as a hero of the horn. I know some people probably loved that, but I hated it for a couple of reasons. For one, they need death to be final for 
somebody in this show. So far, everybody that dies comes back. Hopper died in this episode, but we know he'll be back in the wolf dream likely. Uno's death means less now because he's already back. It just didn't feel earned at all to me. And as much as I love Uno, I think this was very poor fan service. I think maybe the implication is, is that he's Guido Kane, but that didn't feel earned to me. It didn't feel clear to me. I just, I didn't love it. And I don't know what it is about Suroth and Karina McAdams playing her or the way she's being played, but she comes across to me like she's being written as a Power Rangers villain rather than a nuanced villain. She's been a mustache twirler this season when all the rest of the villains have been extremely nuanced. And she gives stupid monologue lines and she narrates out loud, very poorly written in my opinion. I'm waiting for her to throw a staff at the ground and say, make my monster grow or something like like Rita Repulsa in, in Power Rangers or something like that in the episode. It was just, I'm just not a fan of the way she was written. I also think Rand needed bigger moment. We've been slow playing him and he's not been shown to be as powerful as he will be later, which is fine, but they need to show some flashes of it. His moment with Turok showed some power, but not really. He wasn't fighting anybody that could actually fight him back. He needed his own superhero moment, like Egwene's gotten, like Nynaeve's gotten, like even Lan or Moraine have gotten. He needed to defeat somebody, show a glimpse of what he'll become, and we just didn't get that, and that's disappointing to me. But lastly, and this is not the fault of the showrunners, this is entirely at the feet of Amazon. This show needs more time. This episode felt rushed compared to the pacing of some of the other episodes this season, and you could argue, well, why did they put all those other things in those episodes? Well, those other things they put in those episodes are what made this season good. They needed that same time for the ending as well. The show needs room to breathe. If this show got 10 episodes like Game of Thrones did, we'd have a vastly different product. It would be better. They wouldn't have to make such cheesy decisions and rush things. We would have better, de we'd have better development. It's not going to change things by me saying this, but it's the truth. So what did I think of the episode overall? Well, when I take my book reader hat off for a moment, I enjoyed the episode more. I think the non-readers will likely like this episode more than I did my first time through. On my second watch, I enjoyed it a lot more. It's still not perfect, but the final episode is meant to be epic, and they're typically not the same character-driven plots that you would see in earlier episodes, and I think that's largely true for Wheel of Time Season 2. I'll speak more about the entire season in my full season review, but Episode 8 did feel different from the other episodes, and I think that's largely on purpose. It was more rushed, the pacing was pretty frantic, but they did have a ton to cover. If I compare this to Episode 8 of Season 1, this is light years ahead of that. I'm still very excited for Season 3. The episode did not kill any of my enthusiasm for the show like Episode 8 from Season 1 sort of did, but I can't also say objectively that it was an amazing piece of television either. It was entertaining, it was definitely epic, but was it great? In my opinion, not so much. For Episode 8 of Season 2, I am going to give the episode a 7 out of 10. And not because it was a masterpiece, that's still higher than I think some people might think I would have ranked it, but I think it achieved its goal of wrapping up the plot lines, getting me excited for the future, and showing me an epic battle that is far better than you will typically see on television. So what did you think of the episode? Did I get it right? Let me know in the comments of the video. Also, take a moment and like the video and subscribe to the channel to get updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. I will have my full season two review coming out here shortly. Look for that. Huge thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. I could not do this without you. I appreciate all of you. And of course, if you loved this video, check out one of these that you also might like. Thanks for watching and until next time, peace out.